Thank you for the, uh, the warm welcome. Let's see if you like the session first before we applause, though. So, so hang on to that. Um, so I, I'm Martin Woolley. I work for the Bluetooth Special Interest Group. Um, if you've not heard of us, we are the technical standards body behind Bluetooth technology, and we own the brand, so we do some marketing as well. I'm going to kick off with um, some numbers, actually. I'm going to quote a bank. I can't believe I'm here at Cute World Summit, and so I'm going to talk about something a bank said, but Goldman Sachs released a paper last year, and the paper was about the Internet of Things and the kind of economic um, opportunity it represented. And the interesting thing, and I'll move out of the way of my slides here so you can actually see, was they described the Internet as having gone through three kind of stages of evolution. And in the first stage, we're in the 1990s, and there were about one billion PCs connected to the Internet with modems and ISDN lines and bits of string probably as well, that kind of thing. And in the second wave, we're into the year 2000 and onwards, and it's the age of the, the smartphone. And now we have about two billion devices connected to the internet, so it's doubled. But then they turned their, their attention to the near future, the year 2020 to be precise, which is only just over four years away from now. And astonishingly, astonishingly they forecast that there will not be four billion or eight billion devices connected to the internet by this year, but 28 billion, which is a really, 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 really big number. I think that final really was justified because it's so large. Now, I mention this because a lot of those devices that will be connected to the internet in this kind of scenario will be using wireless technologies on the kind of edge tier, the outer tier of IoT architectures. And Bluetooth Low Energy was designed for these kinds of scenarios. Small devices, perhaps connected to sensors gathering data from the environment, perhaps controllable um, using messages over that Bluetooth Low Energy interface, and powered by very small batteries that will last a really long time, hence low energy, possibly powered using energy, energy harvesting techniques and so on. So this is of interest to us, and the figures we see kind of mirror this trend, this sudden acceleration, because since Bluetooth first arrived on the scene in the year 2000, up until 2012, there was an average of around 1 billion devices shipped by manufacturers each year, for a fairly flat line. Then Bluetooth Low Energy kind of kicked in in the marketplace, and in 2013, all of a sudden, we had 2.5 billion devices shipped that year, from, from 1 billion the previous year. Last year, it was well over 3 billion. And this year, we expect to see about 10 million devices shipped every single day with Bluetooth in them. Why am I mentioning this boring stuff that sounds suspiciously like marketing? I'm telling you this because this is a massive opportunity for developers, for technologists of all sorts. It's the biggest opportunity we've had since the internet came along, to be honest. And knowing about technologies like Bluetooth Low Energy, which very much feature in this, is very worthwhile. So welcome to the session. And again, thank you for coming. I have not said that already. So just to make sure everyone is aware of this, we actually now have two types, two flavors of, of Bluetooth. There's the original type, which we used to call Bluetooth because there was only one type. Now we call it Bluetooth Classic if we're talking to consumers. In the spec, it's called Bluetooth BR stroke EDR. And if we're talking to consumers, we've got this thing called Bluetooth Smart. But for technology people like yourself, this is Bluetooth Low Energy. So Bluetooth Low Energy in the technical specs, Bluetooth Smart for consumers, it's the same thing. Now, I think very crudely that there are kind of two use cases for using low power wireless technologies like Bluetooth in the Internet of Things. And one concerns collecting data from sensors and then transmitting it for aggregation and analysis and so on. And the other concerns controlling things, sending commands to devices to make them do stuff, switch the lights on uh, in your house uh, and so on. So I'm going to kick off with a couple of very high-risk live demos. <laughs> I'm sure you're a lovely audience who will be very kind if they go wrong. Just to get things going, and then we'll have a look at how these things actually worked. So just bear with me a second. So what I have here on stage, I've got a few things I'll show you in a moment. Um, somewhat dark, but this is a developer board, a Bluetooth developer board. It's running some firmware that makes it believe it's a heart rate monitor. Now, heart rate monitor is one of the types of device that the Bluetooth Special Interest Group have defined a standard profile for. And I'll talk about profiles later on. Uh, and it's able to kind of simulate heart rate um, behavior and transmit heart rate measurements roughly once a second. And then what I have lurking here on my Android smartphone 
is a kind of modified version of one of the sample applications you'll find in Cube Creator. So if you want to learn about Bluetooth Low Energy and the new 5.5 APIs, um, there are a couple of samples. You can start there, which is what I did. So I grabbed this sample, and I played with this, and I tweaked it and changed it a little bit. And what it's doing at the moment is scanning for my, a heart rate monitor, which is now found. Now I'm connecting to it, and now I can see heart rate values appearing on the screen. Now, it so happens this particular board, you can't see it very well, but near my finger there's a potentiometer, a, a dial I can change. So I can move this dial and slow my heart rate down. My simulated heart rate is not slowing my actual heart rate down, don't worry. <laughs> or I can speed it up, and once again, don't be afraid, it's not real. But what is real is that Bluetooth Low Energy is being used to communicate with acute application right there, right now, on this stage. So let's come out of that. <clears throat> so a couple of things to take away from that very brief demo. Number one, look at the samples. You've already got some good stuff to help you get started. Number two, devices like this, which come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and there's even an iPhone application that will simulate um, defined uh, devices for testing purposes. They're very useful to have in your kit bag. And did I mention that I may well give away some prizes later on as well for people who have been listening and who are nice? So back to the slides. That was using sensors, albeit there isn't a sensor there. It'll do as an example. So the next demo concerns controlling things. Again, live on stage. Never done this one before, actually. This one could be funny, because I actually made this thing. It features my own soldering and lots of Lego. Do we have any people from Denmark in the audience? OK, well, from the rest of us, thank you for Lego. <laughs> Very kind of you. Uh, we really appreciate it. I've actually been to the town of Billund. I just thought I'd mention that as a way of distracting you all whilst I do this. So what I've got here, um, just try and get this thing in focus. I hope you can see well enough at the back. So once again, smartphone on the left. And I've got an Arduino with a Bluetooth low energy shield interface card plugged into it. And some very strange electronics that I made, basically um, a 64 LED matrix, and I can address the, matrix, um, the LEDs individually. And lots of Lego holding it up and holding it together, and some glue and some really bad soldering. And I'm really worried that on the journey here, it's broken, but we'll see. What I want to do is to be able to tell this thing to display different patterns of lights, so predefined, pre canned patterns of lights that I've programmed into the Arduino code. And it'd be great if I could do that wirelessly from my smartphone. There's every chance this thing needs resetting. Let me just press this button, because it goes to sleep. So I'm going to scan for devices now. We'll talk about what all this stuff means shortly. Oh, no, it's not going to work. Come on, you can do it. I brought you all this way from England. You've got to work. One more time. If it doesn't work, then, oh, yeah, one other thing. Oh, there it is. Cool. Just needed resetting. So it should connect to the device now. There we go. I've got a couple of really nasty QML interface. Sorry about this. I'm no expert. Uh, if I touch random ripple, oh, nothing happens. In actual fact, I noticed that um, there's no sign of power. I think this may be a bit dead, actually. Oh, it's very sad. Could we have a, an oh for the device that seems to have died? <laughs> Never mind. Had it worked, you would have seen a glorious display of multicolored lights, and you would have been amazed, trust me. So let's move on as if nothing's happened, and in fact, nothing has happened. And ask ourselves, <laughs> how would that have worked if it had worked? <laughs> I'm so glad you have a sense of humor. Um, I'm going to try and keep mine. So what I want to do now is run through some basic theory, and, and then we'll look at Qt APIs and a bit of code as well. But the most important part of this session is this bit. Because is anyone here completely new to Qt? Never coded any Qt stuff in their lives? Raise your hands. Be brave. Nobody. Right. So you're all people with some experience of working with Qt. So the APIs are the easy bits, if you understand the basic theory. And that's not hard either. But if you go to the APIs without any basic theory, there's a bit more to learn. So Bluetooth Low Energy is a stack. It's a protocol stack. The spec is 3,000 pages long. It's like. Game of Thrones, but for wireless communications. 
Maybe not as exciting, I don't know. However, there are only certain parts of it that applications developers tend to care about, and don't worry, you don't need to read a 3,000-page spec, because the APIs take care of most of the complexity for you. But to highlight a few, we've got something called the Generic Access Profile, or GAP. We've got the Generic Attribute Profile, or GAT, G-A-T-T. -T. And there's something that works behind the scenes I'll talk about called the Attribute Protocol. The rest, don't need to worry about it too much. Let's start with the initial stage. Devices that we want to somehow work together, like phone and dead Lego thing, um, they need to find each other first. So it's a kind of discovery process. And the way this works relies on one of the devices of the two doing something called advertising. And advertising involves emitting small packets of data periodically, quite frequently sometimes, so that other devices that might be interested in finding it can do so. They're going, to, they're going to scan and look at the advertising packets and say, hmm, you look like a device I might be interested in. I can probably show you advertising happening before our very eyes. This is not a cute application. This is actually Java, but oh, you can't see it at all, of course. Oh, I just can't cope. It's too much. So whizzing up the screen there, those are all advertising packets from devices around me. And it's not just my stuff on stage, because I saw some other things show up out in the audience. If I pause it, though, probably a little tricky to read. But each of these timestamps is an advertising packet being received by the Android application. And here we have a breakdown of the fields that are in the advertising packets. Now, advertising packets have space for 20 bytes worth of stuff. But there's a big list of potential fields you can put in there, so device designers choose what they want to slot into that 20 bytes. So if you're writing an application that will work with some particular device, a product on the market, say, it's handy to know what's going to be in the advertising packets. And happily, there are lots of free applications you can download from things like Google's Play Store and the, uh, uh, the Apple App Store and stuff like this that will let you do this, let you scan and find devices and then have a look at what kind of things they can do. I mean. I'm going slightly off script here, but you know it's all gone horribly wrong anyway, so what the hell. Um, so this is from Nordic Semiconductor, um, one of the kind of chip manufacturers. It's free. It's called NRF Master Controller. There are lots of things like this. It's lifting, listing all the devices it can see around it, um, including the one that called, is called Flex there is on my wrist. That's my Fitbit. I might try this again. I'm not giving up on this thing. <laughs> And so on, and then I can connect to one, so I connect it to my device. Well, I'll connect to the Fitbit. And I can explore the things that it has, and I can also see the kinds of um, what was in the advertising packets. Yeah, I'm off, off script and wasting time, so let me just go back. So, advertising is the process by which devices say, I am here. I'm in range, otherwise you wouldn't be receiving advertising packets from me. And by the way, this is how, uh, how Bluetooth beacons work. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard of Bluetooth beacons. About half the audience. So Bluetooth beacons are used for indo indoor location uh, positioning. And they basically advertise packets that contain a unique ID that is um, kind of associated with a physical location. So applications on phones, you're walking through a store or something, receive a packet, they look it up in their database and say, aha, you're in the sporting goods department. I'll offer you something, some, some tennis shoes, something like that. Technical terms. We have gap central and gap peripheral on screen. So we're in, back into our architecture now. And the part of the process concerned with scanning and discovery is um, the responsibility of gap, the generic access profile. And devices have one of actually four possible roles in the world of gap. Usually, a smartphone will be the gap central device, and its job is to scan and discover. So it's listening for advertising packets. The gap peripheral device, in this case, that was my fake heart rate monitor and my Lego device, which I'm going to try again soon. Um, they are the gap peripherals. They're advertising and saying, hey, would you like to connect to me? Next key concept is that devices have state. So state means some kind of data inside the device or available to it from its environment through a sensor, for example or maybe something that lets you configure a behavior of the device. So if it has a temperature sensor, maybe 
the device has as a defined state item the temperature. Maybe the battery level is available as state data. Maybe the device model and serial number. Maybe it's possible to switch on or off things called notifications, which I'll come on to later. So devices have state. Bear that in mind. Once we've discovered a device, and we think, yeah, this is probably one we want to, to connect to, we've probably given the user this choice. We've displayed a list of devices that seem to be candidates for this application. The user will select one, and we'll connect to it. Once we're in a connection, things change, because now we're in the world of GAT and AT, the generic attribute uh, profile and the attribute protocol. Communication between the two devices now uses the attribute protocol, which you don't need to know very much about, but it's good background. And now we're in a client-server architecture, and we talk about the GAT client, and we talk about the GAT server. Okay? So the phone typically is the client, but with a lot of platforms, it can become a server as well. And the device, like the activity tracker or whatever, is typically the server. Let's talk about state data again. It's not just a kind of jumbled mass of bytes that you have to decode. Bluetooth Low Energy and GAT specifically has a way of structuring the data, the state data a device has, uh, which starts at the highest level with things called services. And services are effectively containers for related state data. Some of them are defined by the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, my lot, but you can invent your own. Maybe talk a bit more about this later on. For example, there's a device information service. That's one we invented. It has the device model, manufacturer name, serial number, stuff like this in it. There's also a battery service, which has the battery level available in it and so on. And you can see here a custom service that whoever created this device, they invented not the Bluetooth Special Interest Group. And this is one of the real nice benefits of Bluetooth Low Energy over Bluetooth Classic. Bluetooth Classic, to invent a new type of device, you had to go through the whole standards process to have a new profile, which is really a specification, created for your type of device. With Bluetooth Low Energy, the standardization is all around the building blocks of which services are one. So you can invent new profiles without going through that lengthy standardization process, but still be compliant and still have the benefits of interoperability. If we look more closely at services, we find we're really at the top of a hierarchy. And services contain things called characteristics. So characteristics are themselves also containers for one item of state data. So the battery level that I, I mentioned before, you'd find that the current level of the battery by obtaining a battery level characteristic from the battery service, because that's its owner, and you'd extract the value part. A characteristic has a type indicator, a value, and some properties. Okay? So those are the things that are inside this structure called a characteristic. Characteristics might also have one or more descriptors. Often there are none, though. Descriptors are associated information like metadata, or their ways in which you can configure the behavior of a, a particular descriptor. And I mentioned those things called notifications before. You use descriptors to switch them on or off. And again, we'll come to that more in a second. Excuse me. One thing I didn't mention, I'm going to mention it now. I could have got away with that. Services, characteristics, and descriptors, they're actually all different types of attributes. That's the general term for this stuff, these different types of, um, of state data and containers for state data. We just call them attributes, and services a particular type of attribute. So this is where the attribute protocol gets its name. This is where the generic attribute profile gets its name, because we have this kind of database almost of attributes. And attributes have a type, which is indicated by a UUID. And these are 16-bit values if they've been allocated by us, the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, or they're 1 to 8-bit values if you allocate your own. If you're a device manufacturer or you're building a, um, a GAT server for uh, a mobile device or something like that. You can have more than one instance of the same type of attribute on a device. And so they also have handle values to distinguish between different instances. Now, I'm going to whiz through this part. Attribute protocol, you don't need to know much detail, but there are probably around 20 PDUs, protocol data units, defined in the protocol, but they fall under a number of headings. I'll just run you through them now and point out the important things for you to know. 
First of all, a GAP client, like your smartphone application, can initiate communication with the server by sending a request, and it expects to get a response. If it doesn't get a response in a certain time, that will be considered a timeout, you'll get an error. On the other hand, the GAT client can send things called commands, and it does not expect a response from commands. Now, if I send a request, I have to wait. I can't send another attribute protocol message until I either get the response or we have a timeout. With commands, I can just send them, send, 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 send. Some notes here, though. Whilst we, we will know if our command doesn't reach the, the stack, the device on the other side, the remote device, because there are acknowledgments happening at the link layer, we won't know whether the application receives it and uses it. And we use these when that doesn't matter. We don't care if it misses one, that's fine. So it's a very fast way to send small amounts of data when it's not critical about it reaching the other side. If we turn things around now, the server can initiate communication with the client. It can send things called indications. And if it sends an indication, it expects to get a confirmation back in response. If it doesn't get one, it'll say, hey, that's an error. And here's that word I've mentioned a few times already, notification. So this is a type of attribute protocol message which the server can send to the client, and it can send as many as it likes. And these are used a lot. I've mentioned it a few times because you will encounter them on all sorts of different devices. The heart rate profile, which I was demonstrating on my developer board, it was using notifications to send heart rate measurement values maybe once every second to my application. So knowing how to work with these in application code is useful. So profile, kind of the last word I've been using without properly explaining it, I, I guess. I think so anyway. A profile is not something you'll find on the device itself. Really, it's a specification that brings everything together. Really, it's for people rather than machines. Yes, it defines the services that are exposed over the Bluetooth low energy interface. And yes, that tells us what characteristics it has and so on, but it also defines processing algorithms, how you derive numbers, um, things to do with concurrency and security. They're, they're all brought together in this specification called a profile. Which might beg the question, how might you implement a profile? How would you design a profile? Because as I said earlier on, you can design and implement your own. Um, the thing that didn't work features an amazing Bluetooth profile that I invented, because of course I invented the device. There isn't a standard profile for, for the Lego device. I made it. And the answer to the question might involve a new tool from the Bluetooth Developer Studio. This is free. You can download this and play with it or do serious things with it, whatever you want. It's called Bluetooth Developer Studio. It is, in fact, a design tool for profiles. If I open this, here's the, the incredibly complicated Profile for my Lego device, the, uh, the LED thing's called a Neo Matrix, that's the product. The big bar is a service, so it's, I've got a Neo Matrix service, I made the name, and I've got two characteristics in that service. One called strip control, its job is to, to let me send commands to it, and whatever value I send to strip control controls what happens on the LED lighting strip, hence strip control. If I send a seven, you get a glorious rippling thing that you never saw, but it's great, it's really good. And alongside that, we have strip status. And strip status tells me whether the, the device is busy or available to do something. And down here, I have the operations that it supports. I can read the current value. Are you available? Are you busy? And it supports notifications. So I can actually just switch on notifications and get it to tell me, the application on the smartphone, when its availability changes. So when I get a, an update that says, I'm available now, then I can unlock my user interface and let the user send another command and hey, we see another fantastic display. So this is a design tool, and I have available to me all of the standard profile services, characteristics, and stuff from the Bluetooth uh, Special Interest Group. If I wanted to add the battery service, because it has a battery, I just drag and drop, and hey, presto, it's now got the battery service in my design. But best of all, and I want you to listen carefully this, to this bit, because I want your help. If I do Control G, I can generate code. I can generate code either for a GAT server or a client, like a smartphone. I just change the selector there. So for example, I can generate a fully working Android application complete with user interface that will let me exercise all of the operations defined in my profile from this tool. 
the components that deal with generating code, we call them code generation plugins because it's like a plugin interface, anybody can write them. There's not really any coding involved. Mostly it's text file templates with substitution variables, and there's a bit of JavaScript. If you know the platform you're writing your plugin for, it's very easy. It took me a couple of days, I think, to get my Android thing working. Um, half a day to get uh, the code on here for my Arduino I generated with the plugin I also wrote, and that took me half a day. So my ask is that if any, anyone out there is interested in providing a Qt client um, plugin so we can generate Q, uh, Qt Bluetooth Low Energy code for a selected profile, please just get in touch with me. I'll give you my contact details at the end. It would be fantastic to add Qt to this. I'll do it myself at some point if it doesn't happen, but who has the time? That's my excuse. So that's Bluetooth Developer Studio. Again, a free download from the uh, website. So that's the theory stuff. So I hope you've got that. We're using GAP for scanning and advertising and device discovery. We're using GAT with services, characteristics, and descriptors for interacting with the, the state data on devices. So let's see how Qt 5.5 makes this available for you to play with. Well, here are the classes. We'll just show them up front, make it easier to follow later on. These are the primary ones you, you'll work with. You've got Bluetooth device discovery agent. You'll never guess what that's for. You've got low energy controller, which we use for a lot. And then you've got low energy service, low energy characteristic, and low energy descriptor. And we now know what they're probably about, and you would not be wrong. So let's start with device discovery, because typically this is where you're going to start with your application. You're going to need to do some scanning to find those devices you're interested in, to show the user a list, let them select, then you'll connect, then you'll do stuff. The way device discovery works is you're going to create an instance of Bluetooth device discovery agent, and it has a start method which you will call. It has some signals it can emit, and the key one is device discovered. If device discovered gets emitted, then the slot you connect to is going to receive um, a call with a Bluetooth device info object as an argument. So in other words, you get a call every time it finds a device based on the, the advertising packets it's receiving. You can also stop the scanning process, and you should do this. Scanning is expensive in terms of radio, um, in terms of battery use, because the radio is on all the time. So you should scan for a limited period of time only. So here's an example, here's some code. I'm instantiating a Bluetooth device discovery agent object at the top. Then I'm calling start. Then I'm using a queue timer object to set up a call effectively via, via a signal slot to a method called cancel scan. And in there, I'm going to stop scanning. So I'm letting it happen for three seconds. I think you can see that somewhere, if I could fire this thing. There we go. So yeah, so that's very straightforward. And there's the three, three seconds at the bottom there. So I've kicked off scanning. I'm going to get callbacks. The purpose of this, of course, is to find relevant devices. You know, there might be 100 devices in range. You might be in a crowded place. You need to find ones that are relevant to your application. To do this, it helps if you know what the advertising packets from the type of device you're looking for contain. So a bit of research with one of those free tools I told you about is worthwhile. Sometimes advertising packets include the UUIDs of the services that the device has. And from that, you can go, ah, yeah, this is definitely a heart rate monitor because I can see the heart rate service is represented in those advertising packets. Got some code here. First thing you're likely to want to do is check that it's actually a, a Bluetooth low energy device, because the same APIs deal with both Bluetooth classic devices and Bluetooth low energy devices. You can then call service UUIDs and get a list of the UUIDs that are in the advertising packet. Now, this never worked for me when I tested it, and I don't know if I hit a bug or what's going on there, but I do know that there are plans to do a lot more work in the APIs around the area of advertising, um, processing advertising packets, and also generating them to create, allow you to create GAT servers on the device, not just the, the, uh, per, um, the central mode devices, the client. The other thing you can do, which is very simple and did work for me, is there's a device name in the advertising packets usually, and you can just check that for some known, known strings. So I just hard-coded um, kind of names of the heart rates, monitors I happen to have lying around at home, so I could select them uh, in the advertising packets and show them to the user. So once the user has selected one of these devices, yep, that's my heart rate monitor, I want to connect to it. 
We're going to use this low energy controller class. We're going to construct an instance of it using the Bluetooth device info object that the scanning process gave us. And we're going to call connect to device. And then there's a signal that will be emitted which is connected when the connection is established. There's another signal, state changed, which might be emitted if the state of that connection changes. So, you know, we lose the connection because the user has walked away and we go out of range or something like this. And we can also uh, disconnect uh, from the device by calling another method. So some example code here, you know, I'm creating a low energy controller object using the selected device, connecting to a bunch of signals, then calling connected device to initiate the Bluetooth connection process, after which I can start playing with the services, characteristics, and descriptors on the device. I'm still scowling at this thing down here. <laughs> it was working yesterday. Right. So having connected, the next thing we do is called service discovery. So we need to find out what services are there, decide which ones we care about for our application, and then start doing other things. So once we've connected, we're going to make another call to a method called discover services uh, on our uh, low energy controller object. And we're going to get a series of signals emitted. The signal is service discovered. And that's going to provide me with the UUID of each service that has been discovered on the device. And I'll make note of this in my code in the slot that's connected to, and uh, you know, particularly note those I care about. Once I've got a list of the um, service UUIDs I care about, I can create objects, low energy service objects, co you know, corresponding to those UUIDs by calling create service objects on our low energy controller objects. And you can see I'm doing that uh, a number of times each time I get um, a signal indicating a service was discovered, or at least that's what my sequence diagram shows. So some code here. I've got service discovered is my uh, slot for the service discovered signal. Uh, I'm looking for the heart rate. Um, service here. And once we're done, you know, the service discovery process is finished. I'm creating a low energy service object at the bottom of the screen there for the heart rate service by calling create service object, providing the UUID of that service uh, in my call. And that kind of gives us um, all I need for that service to be useful to me. And now I can work with characteristics and descriptors. And now it gets useful. Up until now, we're kind of getting ready. We're just get, finding our way through this hierarchy. The state data that I want and the stuff that lets me control behaviors like notifications, this is at the characteristic and descriptor level. Once I've got the parent services, now I can start making things happen. So first of all, armed with one of these service objects, I need to call discover details. This triggers some more attribute protocol work behind the scenes. And eventually, I'll get a state changed signal. And I should now have objects I can actually work with. They're more fully populated. They're not just empty shells I created on the client side. So you can see me calling discover details at the bottom of the screen there. And once I've done that, I'm now in a position to start reading real values from those remote devices. Okay, so maybe I just want to find out what the battery level is of my remote device. What I do now is I say to the low energy service objects, I want a characteristic object, please. And I do that by calling the characteristic method, providing a Bluetooth UUID object as an argument. That returns one of these low energy characteristic objects to me. And then I can call read characteristic using that as an argument. And now what I've done again is I'm triggering some attribute protocol interactions behind the scenes between my local device my Qt application is running on and the remote Bluetooth device. Once that operation is completed, which could take some time, some milliseconds or more, I'm going to get a signal characteristic read. And as you can see, we're given a characteristic object, so I know which characteristic this callback, this signal relates to, and a byte array, a byte array excuse me, which is the value itself. <clears throat> so there's some code. Read that whilst I drink. So I'm triggering, uh, I'm calling read characteristic at the bottom. All the other stuff is lead up that we just talked about. And then when I get a call to my slot on characteristic red, which, which I've connected to the characteristic red signal, then I can have a look at the, the UUID 
of the characteristic and say which one is it that uh, I've got the value of and you know, do something that is appropriate given the characteristic whose value has been read, uh, including, of course, taking that value from the qubyte array and, and doing some stuff. Writing characteristics, same pattern, no need to look at that, pretty much all the same things going on. Writing to descriptors, now the question is why would you want to do this, and again the example is notifications. There are quite a big list of different types of descriptor, most of them you're going to read, if anything. The one that is used most commonly is concerned with switching on or off notifications. You're not going to get heart rates measurements sent to you unless you explicitly ask for them by subscribing to notifications on the heart rate measurement characteristic. So, this works by creating a descriptor object from the characteristic that owns that descriptor. So that's what's happening here. We're calling descriptor. It returns a low energy descriptor object, and we're calling it on the characteristic that owns it. Then we call write descriptor using our descriptor object and the value we want it to have. Pretty logical, yeah? It's not hard. I told you, this, this is the easy side if you decide if you know cute, this stuff's really good. And we get a signal that says when the, the write operation has com completed. So there we go, we're calling write descriptor there. And you'll know that sometimes you need to look at specs. So sometimes if you're working with standard services characteristics or descriptors, you need to look at the spec to find out how a value is broken up. Sometimes values can be you know, 20 bytes long, and maybe the first byte is a set of flags. Then you get a 16-bit heart rate measurement. Then you get that breakdown is in the spec. As far as the characteristic is concerned, it has a byte array, and that's its value, but it's up to you to decode it from that point on. The same here with uh, descriptors. This particular type of descriptor is called a client characteristic configuration descriptor. Try saying that fast. It's not easy, I tell you. But client configura uh, characteristic configuration descriptors, nearly didn't get it myself there, um, they are the mechanism by which we switch on or off notifications and, in fact, indications. And we have two bytes, and we set the appropriate one to a one. That's what the spec says, so that's what we're doing here. Switching uh, notifications on means writing hex 0100 to that descriptor. Once we've done that, yes, we'll get a signal that says that the write operation succeeded. And now we know that um, in terms of our kind of local uh, client state, I've now enabled notifications because that operation succeeded. So all that's left now is to actually receive notifications and use them, draw a pretty graph or something like that, or just show some numbers. And this also, surprisingly enough, is very, very easy. So we've seen this bit already. I've just written to my descriptor. I've got the descriptor written signal. After this, every time the remote, the remote device has something to tell me, a heart rate measurement, for example, I'm going to receive a signal characteristic changed along with the characteristic object that it relates to and a byte array, which is the new value. So I've just measured Martin's heart rate again. Um, it's really, really high because he's a bit nervous because his demo didn't work and he's going to keep going on about this demo. Um, so I'll send him a notification. So we get a series of these. So here we go. I've connected clearly. Uh, this is my uncharacteristic changed uh, slot. This is going to get called every time a notification is received and I'm going to do something with it. So I'm going to draw some amazing 3D graphical representation of a heart beating or something like that. Hmm, I seem to be on time. It's nothing short of a miracle. I just want to tell you about a couple of resources we've got. I think I have one more go at this thing, I really am. Um, we have a developer portal, so it's developer.bluetooth.org, and there's all sorts of stuff there. There are developer forums. There are applications you can download for various platforms, not cute yet. We do have something called the um, Bluetooth Platform Capability Quick Reference, which basically is an at-a-glance table of which aspects of Bluetooth Low Energy the different platforms support. I added Qt to it. Uh, it went live yesterday. You're probably the first people to know this. So Qt's on there, and I'll, I, you know, I'm in touch with the, uh, the Qt developer responsible for this area. We'll, I'll make sure this is kept up to date. Um, the thing down there, this is um, something called the Smart Starter Kit. You download a load of different labs, buy yourself an Arduino and some LEDs and resistors, make a project, write the code for the Arduino, write the code for the smartphone platform you're interested in. Uh, again, cute not on that yet, but hey, who knows, maybe one day. Again, if I have the time. 
And Bluetooth Developer Studio, you saw a really quick glimpse of that. It is a fantastic tool. If you're interested in writing that cute code generation plugin, get in touch with me, please. Now, I imagine some of you are here because you fancy winning some kit. Well, I do have a few prizes. And all I want you to do is this. Follow me on Twitter. There's my Twitter handle at the top there. I want you to be creative and tweet something quite brilliant about Bluetooth, about the Internet of Things, or just something nice about the session I can show my boss. Look, they didn't hate me, or at least they really wanted a prize, something like that. Um, and I'll use some very arbitrary algorithm to choose the ones that I like best and, and award you a prize. Some, I'll, I'll be out there somewhere. Make sure you put my Twitter handle in the message so I get a notification, uh, and then I can contact you, and um, we'll take it from there. You'll have to be quick and come and get them, because I, ha I have to catch a flight. Now, bear with me. I should finish at this point, but I'm just going to unplug this and plug it back in again. Does anyone have a hammer, by the way? If you could see the massive blobs of solder in this thing, you'd know. Yeah, I actually think my, maybe my batteries are dead, actually. Because, in fact, this is slightly faulty, and there's um, one of the LEDs is always on, and it's not at the moment. So I suspect my battery's dead, which is very sad. Oh, well. I'll try, but I'm fairly sure the battery's dead. It's very sad. Let me just try this. Yeah, matrix. Scan. No, it's not going to play. OK, well, I think that, my friends, is it. Thank you for listening. Does anybody have any questions for me? <laughs> You're very kind. Thank you. Any questions? Um, oh, your nearest, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there is. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, one of the things Bluetooth Developer Studio has, uh, there's lots of things we didn't look at because of time, uh, is uh, an online repository. So if you create a new profile for something and you want to share it because you want other people to adopt it as a de facto standard, you can publish it in our profile in our uh, repository. Other people can use it from there. Okay. Yes. There isn't. So a very dynamic, um, make yourself this kind of device thing. No, there isn't a standard one that allows you to do that. Interesting thought. How is this typically done? Everybody implements that. How is the actual? Per device, per, uh, per device type. So perverse, per device type, there will be. So every heart rate monitor in the world, presumably, implements the standard um, Bluetooth heart rate profile. And in terms of the practical coding things that people do, it depends on the chipset in the SDK. So some of them you use a JSON format to describe the structure, some it's XML, and some you do it in code. You kind of register services and then register characteristics that they own. So it depends, depends on the platform. If you offer an API for that, somehow the paper has to get in. Say that again, I'm sorry? If you offer an API for that server. Yeah. Are you talking about tools now? I think I don't understand the question. Um, I'm talking about the API. If you were to have an API for a guest server, right. then it would be, you can instantiate it like an object. Right. Be, uh, of course. Yeah, I mean, you could build your own API, higher level abstraction on top of the Qt yeah. Bluetooth Low Energy APIs, that's for sure. So you could have an API for a thing called Q Heart Rate Monitor. Just, I'm just guessing it would have a letter Q. And, and yes, then you could hide the details of the, the classes that we saw just now, for sure, yeah. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Will the developer studio be available for macOS? 
Um, possibly. Um, it's something we're aware of that people, some people want. Um, if you're interested in that, then I suggest you download the tool. You'll then have access to our um, issue tracker, I think. And you can say, new feature vote, I want this. So it's, it's come up a few times. Um, this, by the way, is not in version 1 yet. That's beta you just saw. That's beta 2. Version 1 should be like any day now, as in next week or something. It's really, really close to seeing. Um, it's happening at our head office in Seattle. From what I see, um, there's, there's a release candidate just appeared. Um, so we'll get it working for Windows first, <laughs> and then hopefully for Mac OS as well, and, and hey, who knows, other platforms if the demand is there. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, no. So the question, if you're, I don't know if everyone's hearing the questions, was about iBeacon and whether they're using standard Bluetooth low energy capabilities or whatever, um, and whether you can therefore access uh, work with beacons from acute application. The first answer is yes. Um, advertising packets have various fields that go in them. The list of field types is defined by us. One of them is called the manufacturer data field. It's there for manufacturers to put anything they like in, subject to some, some rules about detail. That's how iBeacon works. They put um, some numbers in there, a major and a minor number, for example, to describe the um, Basically, the, the organization that owns the beacons, the, the, the building the beacons are in, and then the particular location within the building. So that all goes in the manufacturer data field. That's all completely standard. It's what it's for. Qt 5.5 APIs don't have much that lets you get inside advertising packets right now. So I kind of alluded to that. There's, there is a, a method you can call that I think should give you the list of service UUIDs if they're in the advertising packets. Not convinced that works at the moment, but I think it's, under, it's known. And then when I talked further um, about support for advertising, either you know, looking inside those packets for exactly the reason you described, you know, properly parsing out the different fields so they become available um, to your applications, it's on the roadmap. It's a feature request, and also the ability to turn your uh, device into a GAP server, so it's doing the advertising, the GAP peripheral. So I think that will come. And again, I don't really know how Qt's um, kind of manage priorities. If you're able to vote for things, then, then go do that. Yeah, because things like beacons. Uh, last year was regarded as the year of the beacon pilots. You know, organizations were trying beacons in museums and supermarkets and airports and stuff like this. This year, according to industry analysts, is the year that they get rolled out in big volumes, millions. Okay? In London, we have a lot of them already in, in prime shopping areas. So, so yeah. Any other questions? And please tell me to stop when I need to stop. <laughs> Because otherwise, I won't stop. Yes, sir. And those various IDs that we saw on the screen. Yeah. How are those assigned? If I come to those uh, device prototypes or maybe series, uh, do I have to pay anything to use those IDs or are they private ranges? Um, so there are 16 bit UUIDs that the Bluetooth Special Interest group, group have allocated to services, characteristics, and so on that we, we've defined. You can use them free of charge. You know, that we just published the register, you can use them as long as you're using them for the prescribed purpose. If you're inventing something new, you are either going to use a 128-bit UUID from a different range. We own a certain range in that number value, number set. Or if you want a short 16-bit UUID, then yes, you have to pay some money to us to acquire the right to use a 16-bit value from our base range. I, I don't know how much it is. I'm not involved in the, the money stuff. But yes, that's all on our website. Anyone else? Oh, he's going for his chin. I thought that was a hand going up there. This is like an auction. Yes, sir. There's a likelihood that these new IDs are going to collide somehow. Very slim. Very, very slim. I mean, the, the algorithm by which UUIDs are generated is owned by IEEE, I think. So it is a, stand, a UUID is itself governed by a standard. The detail involves nanosecond precision time. Um, in, in generating the UUID. If you type UUID into any, any Linux box, you'll get a value. The likelihood of a collision is infinitesimally small. Let me know if you manage to do it. I'll, I'll give you a prize. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, sir. What is the, the range? Oh, this is a great question. Because the answer is it all depends. 
I'm glad you asked, actually, because I think there are lots of um, myths about, well, actually, about range and security with Bluetooth, my two favorite questions. Um, whoa. The technology, in terms of physics, can have a very long range, a kilometer. It generally doesn't, because the real world also exists, and it's not just about theory. What typically happens is manufacturers have to make some choices. What's most important to me? Um, very low power consumption, so the battery will last for three years. Or, or longer range, because this needs to work in a reasonably large home, and it needs to go through walls. So they make decisions that can turn power consumption and antenna design and stuff like this. So you may find 30 meters is the range that you have. But that's not because that's all Bluetooth can do. It's because that's what the manufacturer decided, tweaking all these different variables to get the optimum performance from their device. That's what they ended up with. But just to um, illustrate this in a way that you can go and check, um, the way consumer electronics works is most consumer electronics or, um, companies, they don't make Bluetooth chips. They, they source them from other manufacturers. They're usually called modules. These are like systems on a chip with an antenna built in, stuff like this. The board I was using, actually, is from a company called Blue Giga. They just got acquired. They're now called Silicon Labs. But they have a long-range Bluetooth module you could put in your consumer electronics device with a range of 450 meters. So the range is probably much higher than you think it, it is, based on experience of maybe older devices. And the other thing to be aware of is that what we're talking about there is peer-to-peer -peer range. You can create mesh networks out of Bluetooth low energy devices. Right now, and there are lots of there are commercial products out there, this isn't like theory, this is real. Right now, the mesh networks, <coughs> excuse me, the devices that make mesh network works are using proprietary protocols on top of Bluetooth low energy. But we have a working group, actually the biggest one we've ever had with like 80 different companies involved, creating a global industry standard for creating mesh networks on top of Bluetooth low energy. And we're expecting version 0 0.9 of the spec, which is ready for prototyping. Manufacturers can take it, start building. That should be this year. It's very close. This is going to have a massive impact in the world of Bluetooth low energy and devices. If you're not familiar with mesh networks, imagine a mesh with lots of interconnections between thousands of devices spread across a very large area, maybe in a very large building. All devices can communicate with each other as long as there's a path from one to another, and you know, messages get relayed, basically. So for large buildings, airports and things, this is quite critical. It's a whole area of the, uh, the whole Internet of Things um, phenomena that this will, will matter for. So watch that space. Long answer to a simple question. Anyone else? Uh, no? Throw me off. Yeah, I think uh, we are, uh, our time is gone. Uh, of course, you can follow up the discussion uh, with outside. Martin yeah. uh, afterwards. Uh, so let's thank Martin uh, again. Thank you.